Welcome back to uh, this day of the presentations at Erik Penzer Bank. Um, now we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Magnus Nilsson, who is uh, the CEO of Elanders, to presentate, uh, present the uh, company here. So very welcome, uh, Magnus Nilsson, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to, to my presentation of Elanders. And if we then go to slide number two. Uh, today, Landos has a yearly sales of around 11 billion Swedish crowns. We have around 6,000 employees in 20 countries. And as you can see in the map, it's uh, Europe, our biggest region, with 69 locations and around 4,600 employees. And after that, we have Asia with 18 locations and 1,300 employees. And we have Americas with seven locations and 400 employees. So in total, we have 90 locations globally. If we then go to slide number three. On this slide, you can see our major custom segments. And um, as you can see to the left, there is automotive. That's around 25% of our sales. Then we have the biggest area, that is electronics, with 35%. Fashion and lifestyle, with 15%. Healthcare and life science with 5%, and then we have industrial with 15%. If we then move to slide number four, uh, on this slide we try to, to illustrate Alando's what we call end to end solution that we're offering our clients. So if you look to the left, you can see our major clients that I just talked about. And then if you look up in the middle of the presentation, you can see which kind of services we are offering our clients. And uh, even if the character is rather different between our different business areas or custom areas, all the services we are providing are very similar, which means that we normally can have multi-sites where we are doing service in a combination for both maybe automotive, industrial, or even fashion and lifestyle in the same multi-site. So our services start from inbound services where we receive goods. Uh, we take care of sourcing and procurement for our customers. We do custom service declarations for, for the goods coming in from outside the countries. Uh, we also do warehouse inventory and management. And as next step, we have light production and assembly of products where we do assembly and testing. We have lots of quality control functions of incoming goods. We also do some repairs in an early stage if needed. And we also do some print production for customers who had that need. And then, of course, we have different solutions for order management. Uh, we work a lot with global clients. That's why we have solutions for global order management. We're, today we are receiving lots of orders via e-commerce and for our manufacturing clients we are offering just-in-sequence deliveries as well. And next step is distribution and outbound services where we pick and pack the different products that our company or uh, our customers, customers are ordering or what we need to send to their factories. We consolidate shipments and we do everything from global to to local deliveries. So if you look to the right, you can see there which uh, recipients we have. So sometimes we're delivering just one package for consumer, especially in the fashion lifestyle area. We are delivering batches for retail. Sometimes we deliver to e-commerce customers, to our customers. And then of course we have the factory del deliveries for manufacturing. And we also do lots of logistics for hospitals where we are delivering medical consumables directly to the hospitals. And then as an additional service, we have the area we call life cycle management that we offer all our customer segments. And there we have services like reverse logistics and we do uh, maintenance and we also do installations of our customers' products at their customer site. Could be like big office printers or medical equipment. We also do repair and refurbishment service for our customers, warranty handling, distribution of spare parts, and also what we call value recovery service. So then if we go to the next slide, I want to present uh, one of our case, typical case in automotive for, uh, for one of our automotive customers, where we are offering a complete end-to-end -end supply solution 
So if you look at the illustration down to the left, you can see there to the left of the illustration, it says suppliers, and there could be around 100 different suppliers who are making the parts that in the end will be the car. And then if you go to the other side, uh, the right side, we have different factories where our customers are manufacturing their cars that we should then supply with parts. So we are getting information from all the factories every day. Today we are building following cars. And normally it's every car unique because you can do different choices as customers from interior choices, different engines and so on. We get our needs and then we will coordinate. So the suppliers are delivering all the parts into our cross dock. You can see in the middle where we receive all the parts. And then we are making a check of the, uh, the goods we are receiving. We are bundling the goods and then we are sending just in sequence into the car factory because they don't have any storage at the factories. It's a pure just in sequence flow. And we talk about volumes, about 60 full trucks every 24 hours going that direction. If we then go to the next case, the uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of one of our customers in fashion lifestyle. It's a big international football club where we handle all their merchandises. And this is a pure, what we call omnichannel solution because we are serving both their fan shops, we are delivering to retail partners, and we're also handling all their e-commerce volumes. So it means if someone at home are ordering a, a football shirt, uh, they decide which name, if it's the player's name or their own name. Then we also are doing print on demand on the shirts because all of them are stored uh, uh, neutral. So we will then print on the shirts. We can do some other services as well. We pick other products they're ordering and then we deliver it directly to the consumer. And everything is done in a, an automated picking line uh, to, be, to have a high speed and, and flexibility. So if we then go to the next slide, uh, this is another example of an end-to-end -end solution, but then in the healthcare and life science area. Uh, and for these customers, we are doing all type of services from receiving goods. We are storing consumables. We are storing their, their medical equipment. We are delivering the medical equipment to their customers. Sometimes we make pre-installation of, of the equipment. We are sending all the consumables to their customers. And we also have our own repair center with 20 technicians who take care of when it's if it's, there's a need for repair of the equipment. We will pick it up at the customer, bring it back to our reserve center, uh, repair center. We fix the equipment, we send it back. We also do uh, have our own technician on the field where we do uh, on-site services. And another part is also that we do all the recycling of equipment that will not be used anymore. We take it back, take it down in parts, and some parts will be reused, and other parts will go for recycling. So it's a typical end-to-end -end solutions, including what we call also life cycle management service. If we then go to the next slide, uh, the next slide shows our uh, value recovery service. Um, where we are uh, taking care of used PCs, printers, mobile phones, and tablets. And the whole idea around this is when our customers have used their equipment normally for three years, it's normally paid off. We will then buy the equipment for them. We secure that all data will be erased. Um, we do some refurbishment. We put in new software. Then we resell. Uh, uh, this, uh, this products, which means that we normally can go for maybe just a three years lifespan to six or seven years, which uh, is, is a huge saving for the environment. So it's a very interesting case where we have a high focus to grow for the future. And then if we go to slide number 10, so the next slide, thank you. And then if you look at the financials for the third quarter in, in 2020, um, we had like lots of other customers, uh, a, a pretty weak second quarter because of the COVID-19 effect. 
that we are we were very happy to see the third quarter result that actually was our best result ever. And in the third quarter, we managed to perform an EBITA margin of 6.8% compared to 6% the year before. And we also increased our result in the quarter with 25% before tax compared to the year before. And uh, one of the reasons was that we could see a, a, see a rather strong recovery in almost our, all our customer segments. And we also managed to perform an organic growth of 3%. We also uh, secured several important customer agreements that we could renew during the third quarter that are giving us an annual sales of around five to 700 million crowns. We also continue to show a strong cash flow, which we have done the whole year. Uh, and this led to a lower, lower leverage, which means that the group will benefit from lower interest rates going forward. And we also uh, acquired a company in the life cycle management area, a company named Azalea IT, and they're actually doing service in the value recovery segment, what, uh, what, what I just talked about in the slide before. So they have specialized, but they have specialized more on network equipment and also on servers. Okay, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, here I want to show how, how Alandos have managed to improve our financial position the last years. So if you look at the, on the left side, we are now on, in January, rolling in, in January to September, exclude, excluding IFRS 16. We are now down to 2.5 in net debt EBTA. And if you just look on, on, uh, on the illustration, you can see that in 2017, it was actually 4.73. So here we can also show that we can go up temporarily in debt, but then we have a strong underlying cash flow that makes it possible for us to go down in, in debt. And uh, you can also say in, see in the middle here that the operating cash flow for January, September in 2020 has actually been even stronger than 2019. And our net gearing is now down to 0 0.55. If we then go to the next slide. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing how it looks for our two business areas. And I start with supply chain solutions. That is our absolute biggest area. And then if you look to the right there on the and um, on the numbers, you can see that uh, supply chain solutions was the driver behind the improved profit in Q3. So their adjusted EBITA went up from 131 to 162. And also, even more important, was that they managed to do an EBITA margin of 7.6% compared to 59 uh, and this shows that uh, the saving program that we done in 2019 results in much better margins in this area when sales comes back on normal levels. Uh, if we then go down and look at print and packaging uh, that had a really tough second quarter because of the COVID-19, uh, they also recovered in Q3 and they managed a result that was almost in line with the year before. We then go to next slide, and then we take a look how the sales have been going for our different customer segments. And if we then start with automotive and look at the third quarter in 2020, it's marked in gray to the left, and then you have the third quarter in 2019 to the right. You can still see that we are we are behind in sales for automotive area, but we could still see a very strong recovery in the third quarter compared to the second quarter with a very high sales in July, but very slow sales in August because lots of our customers closed down for a longer period than normal when it was holiday period, but then they had a strong recovery in, in September. If we then look at electronics in the third quarter, also lower than uh, in, the year before, but that's uh, Underlying, they're actually slightly better. It's that we had a big buy and, buy and sell uh, deal in Asia in 2019 with low margin 
that we have decided to not do anymore. So if we compare underlying numbers, we, are, we actually have an improvement in electronics. And one reason is, of course, that the demand of laptops has increased a lot in, in this year when people are working much more from home and homeschooling and, and things like that. If we then go to the... And we also have one more thing. Uh, uh, just one more thing about electronics. Here we, we secured and renewed very important contracts with almost 40 to 50 million euros. Okay, next slide. So if we then look at fashion lifestyle, you can see here that we had a very strong growth in Q3 compared to the, the same quarter in the year before. And the reason behind the growth was that we could see a very strong recovery in retail sales, but we could also see uh, increasing volumes for our e-commerce customers in the fashion lifestyle area. And then the subscription box business we have in the US also continues to grow and haven't, there haven't been any effect on that sales for, from COVID-19. It has actually increased during the whole year instead. If we then look at healthcare life science, you can see there is much higher sales in Q3 compared to the year before. But uh, the reason is uh, that we got this deal to, to deliver protective equipment for hospitals in Americas. And uh, the biggest part of this volume was actually in Q2, but we still had some volumes in, in Q3 and that has, bo has boosted the sales. But underlying healthcare is going very well and there is no decline in that one. So then if we go to the next slide, uh, if we look at industrial, we could also see in Q3 still a bit weaker than the year before, but a better recovery than we could see in, in automotive and industrial was actually only 5% behind the year before in, in the third, third quarter. So then if we go to the next slide. So if we then look at the outlook going forward, um, I must say uh, after the very strong recovery in, Q, in Q3 and especially also how, how good we have been working with cash flow and how we have managed to get go down in net debt, I must say that we are very, very carefully optimistic going forward. And I think Elandos have also shown that our existing business model with the very diversified customer base combined with the geographical spread also shows that we can handle very challenging marketing conditions. For example, in Q1, we have a strong effect of COVID-19 in Asia, but then Asia recovered quickly in the second quarter, then instead we had the impact in Europe. But this, that means that also Asia managed to balance the huge impact we had in Europe in Q2 and in Q3, all the geographic areas was, was coming back. But however, we need to be careful going forward because we don't know uh, which impacts COVID-19 will have when we enter next year. So we will continue to be very careful with our investments and we will prioritize that we will have a strong underlying cash flow. And if we look at the, the group's cash position, uh, then we have uh, more than 1.4 billion crowns available. And uh, interesting to know is that we had 1.2 before entering the COVID-19. So we have actually, during this challenging year, managed to improve our cash position, which we are very happy for. And we can also see that the pandemic also creates some new opportunities. Uh, especially now in Q3, we have been approached by many potential customers that we have not worked with before, that looks for a strong partner, uh, especially in these uncertain times. We can also see when it comes to our print and packaging area that some of our competitors have actually been insolvent, which already have benefited us with additional volumes from some of our customers. Okay, that was everything for me, and I will open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Magnus, for this presentation. Um, a few questions uh, now. Um, looking at your uh, customer base, it's very diversified, both in terms of different industries, but also uh, when it comes to geographies. Um, 
things are perhaps very uncertain now when it, when it comes to the, the winter and the COVID-19, but how, are there any markets or industries that uh, you think look better uh, approaching 2021 and some uh, which are perhaps a little bit weaker? How, how do you see the outlook going forward on the different businesses on the customer side? Yes, when it, when it comes to electronics, I think we will have uh, we will see a very stable demand also when we are entering 2021. I uh, could just see uh, the latest reports from both you know big companies like HP and Dell. All of them talk about increased sales and stable outlook. And it's also in electronics we can do more of this lifecycle management uh, services. So there's new business to gain. And fashion or lifestyle, I must say, it's of course we are now getting more and more e-commerce business. It looks like we can then balance out a bit if the retail side is going down. So, and we also have lots of RFQs on the fashion lifestyle as extremely high activity. That company now will increase their e-commerce part. So, I think that could that would be actually an organic growth next year. Uh, healthcare will be stable. I think the protective gearing material will unfortunately go down. It's, not, it's more original in uh, buying just now. Uh, I, I think the big question mark for us, like for many other companies, are the automotive and industrial area. I think industrial is more stable now, but automotive, I think, is the big question mark for us going forward. It's, it's really, it's very uncertain for the moment. So. So that gives some impact. All right. Um, when it comes to the uh, printing side, you mentioned that you have you have a strong and stable position, which perhaps many of your competitors do not. And uh, as they uh, uh, have uh, difficulties in uh, in maintaining their businesses, you can take uh, order volumes from them. Uh, how much potential is there in this? And, and uh, can you handle? Uh, in, in what um, respect can you handle? perhaps printing volumes in terms of geographies. Is this also a global potential business for you in terms of uh, meeting uh, competitors' uh, volumes who are, have lost them, basically? Yeah, I, I think I must say that our, our printing uh, area has, uh, has really developed in, in a good way. And I think we are performing much, much better than lots of our competitors. And we, we are one of the few global ones left. So. And I think we have we have a very strong concept when that we print high volumes in low cost countries like Hungary and Poland for the Swedish and German market, and then we combine that with uh, digital print in, in Germany and UK and, and Sweden, and this has one been one of the key factors to how we can take out local competitors in in Germany and Sweden, and and then of course we still have lots of big industrial and automotive clients that want us to, to uh, support them globally, especially when it comes to car manuals, manuals for trucks, marketing materials, things like that. And I must say, we don't have many competitors left in that area. So I, I think printer packaging will continue to be a very good basic business for Alandos going forward. Right. Um, you uh, pointed to uh, the strong uh, balance sheets and, and the improved cash positions compared uh, cash position compared to uh, pre covid-19 levels um, you have obviously made very large acquisitions in the past uh, how, how do you view that in the years uh, going forward here perhaps on a little bit uh, longer term uh, when it comes to uh, acquiring perhaps additional companies yeah i think now we are when we have restored our, our balance sheet we are of course very open to, to new acquisitions because I think it's a, it's a really good way to, to develop uh, your offer for your customers and we want to grow in the, in the more uh, you know, value added services for our clients. So, but I think it will be more small and medium sized companies like this SLA IT that we bought can be, of course be much bigger than that. But I think we will focus in, on customers in the area we call life cycle management, you know, with a high level of service, uh, a business that you don't lock up cash, no inventory, but more, much more service oriented. And then of course, in this value recovery, we want to grow and to build out our global offering in that area when it comes to take backs of IT equipment to refurbish and and then to then sell so i think we will we will be much more aggressive going forward in acquisition but 
more small, medium size that would give us more added value and also to support us to increase our margins for the group. Okay. Uh, also, lastly, I'd like to ask about the, uh, you, you mentioned the uh, sort of one-off businesses in, uh, in uh, healthcare this year, uh, but you have an underlying growth there also. Uh, what kind of um, uh, sort of um, growth do you target in the healthcare segment going forward? Now we are, our focus area is mainly in the more medical equipment side and com, you know, combined with consumables. It's not so much for, you know, for medicine and things like that. So um, we have a very strong position in that in Germany and we will now, uh, together with our biggest client, set up a, a completely new site with high optimization focusing on this area. So we, we are there, we are more aiming for organic growth and we will have a really nice showcase. And here we talk about the contract that is five plus five years. It's a uh, it's very important, uh, important step we have made there in the healthcare segment. Okay, Marius Nilsson, thank you very much for this presentation and best of luck going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.